Good evening, friends, and welcome to a late-night edition of Crime Time with Duty Ron. Guys and girls, you know the drill. I'm a retired New York City police detective and a 9-11 World Trade Center first responder. If you like all things true crime related from the police detective's perspective, you're in the right place. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell so you'll get all things Duty Ron when I go live or upload another video. And tonight I spared you guys the intro because... I have some specific information I want to get to you as it pertains to the Rex Hurum and Gilgo Beach uh, murder suspect case. Police Commissioner from Suffolk County, Rodney Harrison, gave his first interview in over three weeks. I counted three weeks. Um, he hasn't spoke. Uh, we've heard from the Suffolk County District Attorney, Ray Tierney, uh, extensively. He, in my opinion, he, he is... Is spoken, spoke too many times and is saying too much. Uh, and you don't usually hear uh, a prosecuting uh, district attorney, he's going to prosecute this case. Usually they're tight lipped and they don't say much. And kudos to the police commissioner for keeping tight lipped. But he broke his silence tonight and he gave an interview. And I want you guys to listen to it because if you listen carefully, you're going to hear some things that just doesn't add up when it, you hear both of them talk. It doesn't seem like the district attorney and the Suffolk County Police Commissioner have a, uh, I mean, I know they have a working relationship, but it actually seems to me like there's some tension. And you let me know in the chat if you feel the same way, if there's some tension between the two of them, because the district attorney, Tierney, never mentions the police commissioner. And the police commissioner, because he's a gentleman, mentions the district attorney in this interview. Um, I want to say a special thank you to the Patreon supporters, the channel members, the folks who positively engage, the subscribers, the replay viewers, the folks who give super thanks when they watch the replays. You guys are awesome. The replay viewers, the live chatters. And again, we can't do this without the mod squad. So a special thank you to my neighbor across the street, Diane B for being a, a great mod um, my good friend Dawn Marie, Donna Marie, and all of the Mod Squad, Joey Brooklyn, head of security. Thank you, Joey, for being here. Now, um, as it pertains to this case, uh, we also had the defense attorney, um, defense attorney for Rex Hurman, fighting that buccal swab. That's the cheek swab for the DNA. Uh, the district attorney wants to tighten up his case and get an actual cheek swab. They um, fought it in court, and today a judge said, no, no, you are going to give that cheek swab, and uh, his attorney will be in his, in pre in, his attorney will be present when the, um, the lab folks take the swab from Rex Hurman's cheek. Now that's going to be done at the Suffolk County Jail. But let's take a listen to this short news piece from today about this cheek swab. A judge ordered suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer Rex Hurman to submit a DNA swab despite his lawyer's objections. The judge said contrary to the defense's contentions, there is probable cause to believe Hewerman committed the three murders with which he is charged. The swab will be taken in the presence of Hewerman's attorney. Investigators want to compare the sample with DNA recovered from a pizza crust discarded outside Hewerman's office and a hair recovered from one of the victims. And it's not only just a hair that was recovered from one of the victims, one, one strand, I believe, of his hair, and I believe three strands or maybe less, don't hold me to that number, it's either two or three strands of his wife's hair. Um, but this cheek swab has nothing to do with um, Asa, um, his wife, has nothing to do with her, it is, has everything to do with him. Um, but... I was so happy to hear and see the judge uh, overruling the, um, the, dis the, the defense attorney's argument to um, suppress a cheek swab. Come on, really? Are you kidding me, guy? But that's what defense attorneys are supposed to do. He did his job. Let me say hello to a couple of people in the chat. Princess Mitch, Cheryl, Joey Brooklyn, 
Diane B., Darlene Wolf, I hope you're recovering well from your surgery. Several grafts on her leg, uh, and she's uh, she's got a battle ahead of her. So sending you a lot of strength and positive vibes, my good friend. I hope you're feeling better. Good to see you on Crimes Uncovered. Thank you for being here. Um, Kel, it's always great to see you. Uh, thank you. Let's unpack that. Hey, Kristen, good to see you. Thanks for joining. All Summer Long is here. Uh, a whole bunch of people late at night. I didn't think that you guys, that I would have any kind of a crowd, to be honest with you. Hi, Dawn Marie. Uh, but I appreciate you guys being here. So listen, um, by a show of hands here in the chat, how many of you have seen this interview in its entirety with Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney K. Harrison. Just by a show of hands, if you've seen the entire interview, put a one in the chat. If you've seen some of it, put a two. If you haven't seen it at all, put a three. So I know what we're dealing with here. But this is going to be 26 minutes. It's um, it's a it's worth the listen because at the end of this 26 minutes, I'm going to break down some of the um, some of the things that I have observed from this. Uh, and I'm going to link down below Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney's interview, which was five days ago. Ray Tierney, the Suffolk County District Attorney, gave one of many interviews. He's been on a circuit of going around and giving interviews to everybody. But five days ago, he gave this same news outlet, uh, which is um, Newsday. Um, he he gave an outlet, I, I think it's, yeah, Newsday TV. So he gave them an interview five days ago. But when I compared these two interviews and when I look at all of the interviews, right, I, I don't, I didn't see how you guys felt about this, but does anybody sense the same tension that I'm sensing between the district attorney who's charging this case? He is going to fight this case for the state in court. You don't usually see the elected district attorney do working these cases and unless it's in a small jurisdiction in a tiny jurisdiction then you might see the elected district attorney fight the case but usually their assistants fight the case um he's he's decided to fight the case and he's also the mouthpiece for this um, thank you so much, uh, Sanctuary, for being here, the Literary Sanctuary. She says, thank you, Duty Ron. Thank, uh, wait a minute. Thank you, Duty Ron. Glad I caught alive. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, Schmitty, you sense it, and I know that you're pretty keen on a lot of different things. Schmitty pays attention to the fine details. Um, you know, again, from being a detective, I, I really home in on these things. And, you know, the Suffolk County Police Chief uh, police commissioner Rodney Harrison is a gentleman. Uh, uh, don't forget, he was the chief of detectives in the largest police department in the United States, the NYPD. So Rodney Harrison was not only a detective, but he rose through the ranks to be the chief of all the detectives in the NYPD. This is a seasoned, very, very experienced investigator. And he says a few things in this interview that ring true to all good detectives, like talking about walking the crime scene. If you guys noticed, I went to Rex Hurman's outside of his home. I didn't go out there to gawk. I didn't go out there to, um, to you know, yell and scream and cause a ruckus and cause public alarm. I went there because that was my detective sense, that I wanted to get a feel for the, the stories and the, the reporting that I'm bringing to you, I wanted to get a feel what it was like to be there out in front of that house and then take that ride during the day when it was light out from Rex Hureman's home to Gilgo Beach on Ocean Parkway. And then I did it at nighttime because I wanted to feel what that felt like. I wanted to get a feel for what if and if Rex Hureman did this or did any of these crimes at his home, how that ride felt and how long it took and the landscape that was there. So I did that to give you guys a bird's eye view from a detective's perspective. But Rodney Harrison talks about that here. 
He's asked in this interview, why did you go? The first thing you did when you got sworn in to be the police commissioner of Suffolk County, why did you go out to Gilgo Beach? And you're going to hear what he has to say. So um, thank you, Lucy Bell. Thank you for that. Um, Deco Paint and Tea, always great to see you. Thank you for joining. So let's take a listen to Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harris. This is a first interview, first interview in over three weeks. He's been silent, silent, silenced for three weeks. Now, was it Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney telling him back up? Because if you listen to Ray Tierney, he never mentions the police. He never mentions the investigators. What Ray Tierney, in, 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 and you guys can listen to this for yourself. This is not just me trying to create drama here. But the district attorney is only mentioning his district, the, the, the district attorney investigators. He does give credit to the task force, but he's mainly talking about his investigators. And I think that that is... Uh, you know, there's no room for a one-way street. This is a team effort. It's it's about the team, and the police commissioner talks about the team here. Um, so let's take a listen to this. This is the full interview. It's 26 minutes long, but this is well worth the listen. From day one, he promised to focus on the Gilgo Beach killings. Uh, grateful for the partnership, the teamwork that came together. Uh, being able to then then catch that green avalanche to uh, Mr. Herman, uh got this case going in the right direction. So where is the investigation heading now that Rex Hewerman has been charged and another Gilgo victim has been identified? Suffolk Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison is sitting down with Newsday TV for a one-on-one -on -one And I'm going to say this. I'm not going to stop it again. I'm going to let it roll. But I'm going to say this. The reason this case was solved is because of guys like this that came in with an open mind from a large investigative police department, meaning the NYPD, the largest police department in the United States, the most experienced detectives because of volume. And it's not a, it's not a, a, a boasting thing. The NYPD detectives are tried true and true through and through with volumes of murders that they investigate they're not dusty small police departments get very short you know very small amount of cases that they have to work this guy comes with a lot of experience and he takes the bull by the horns and now let's take a listen to what he has to say conversation about the gilgo killings this was just uploaded five hours Hello ago. and welcome to Studio 2 in Newsday's Melville headquarters for this Newsday TV one-on-one -on -one conversation with Rodney K. Harrison, Suffolk County's police commissioner. Welcome, commissioner, and thank you for being here and for talking to Newsday TV and our Long Island audience about the ongoing Gilgo investigation. Thank you for having me. You made Gilgo killings a priority from day one of your administration, going so far as to visit Ocean Parkway uh, I believe on the day you were sworn in in 2021. So what were you thinking on the way there? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, backstories to why I went there so early on in my in my time frame uh, as the uh, newly sworn in police commissioner. I had a uh, conversation with the county executive, Steve Ballone, and there were a couple of things that he asked me to take a closer look at. And, uh, you know, there was a reform plan that he wanted to have implemented. Uh, but also, I think one of the main reasons why he nominated me to be police commissioner because of my investigative background. You know, I did uh, 30 years in NYPD. Out of that 12 years, uh, I was part of conducting investigations or overseeing them. Uh, so one of the things that I thought uh, would be important to me to kind of uh, get a little bit of a better understanding is, uh, take a look at the, where the crime scene is and, and see um, what was there. Is there something that we could have missed? Is there something that uh, the investigators uh, for the last 12 years uh, could have did a little bit better with? Um, and, and that's something that I learned during my time frame in the city as being a detective, being a sergeant, 
uh, in the detective squad, as well as being the chief of detectives, is it's always good to take a look at the crime scene and uh, evaluate what's what's there and uh, what can we do better to get the investigation going in the right direction. And and that's one of the main reasons why I went over there and I, I thought it was instrumental just me taking a look at the landscape of uh, Ocean Parkway and what uh, what's going on in that in that area. Well, interesting. And there's a full video of him walking that whole four and a half mile stretch of where the remains of the Gilgal Four and the other remains of up to 11 human beings. He walked it on foot. Definitely, definitely a great detective. Shortly thereafter, or sometime thereafter, you said, I believe this case is solvable. Yeah. From my brief interview with what's been done so far, I like our chances. I like our chances. No one before you, to my recollection, had ever said anything like this before. Yeah, so I, I think every case is, is solvable. Um, I, I think the uh, most important thing is providing the appropriate resources uh, to an investigation. And that's one of the things that I, I want to believe that I brought to this investigation is uh, identifying dedicated investigators to this case. Um, one of the things that I quickly learned uh, after speaking to my detective lieutenant, Kevin Byer, that they had one investigator assigned to the case and he was still catching other cases. And uh, just knowing what I know and just knowing from my time frame in, in the city, um, I knew that was going to get the job done. And we had to uh, take people out of what's called catching orders and pretty much dedicate them to solely investigating this homicide that's uh, you know, really uh, long overdue of uh, being closed out or identifying a subject. So it was um, it was a nice eye opener for me uh, after I was briefed by the Detective Lieutenant Kevin Byra regarding you know the the landscape of who was investigating it. I asked Kevin. I said, "Listen, this is what we're going to do going forward. I want a sergeant. I want at least two detectives dedicated and assigned to this case." And uh, that got the ball rolling. Well, it's interesting. Now he said there before he came on board, there was one detective working the Gilgo Beach murders, but he was also catching cases. And he put a stop to that. And he doubled down with a supervisor, a sergeant, and two detectives working exclusively just on this case. And that was huge that he did that. Interesting, because you did mention your time in the city, but you've also worked with other people, uh, DA Ray Tierney and yeah. Suffolk Sheriff Dr. Errol Toulon, they all worked in New York City too. Mm -hmm. So did that perspective between city and suburb, that perspective kind of help you in taking a different look at this case? So our, my relationship with Ray Tierney, um, we, we did some work together while I was a chief of detectives in Brooklyn North and he was a assistant district attorney uh, working under Eric Gonzalez, the, right. the, the DA out there. And uh, we did a couple of uh, conspiracy gang takedowns uh, out there. Really great work uh, partnering up with Eric Gonzalez and, and Ray Turney during that time frame. Uh, I didn't have much of a relationship with Earl, uh, but uh, I knew of him. I, I knew he was a uh, solid law enforcement official out here. And, and uh, I, I, I knew it was going to be important for us to work together. And not just for the Gilgo case, for just making Suffolk County safe. And uh, I prioritized when I got here, making sure I worked with Ray, I worked with Earl. And if we had to get other resources involved with either Gilgo or other investigations, uh, I, I made myself available to do that. Now, your NYPD background, that come in handy because you did have to work with NYPD and also Nassau County in this case. Yeah. So the one thing I learned in NYPD, and I kind of shared this during uh, my uh, our press conference, is uh, I learned a lot regarding making sure we work with all of our law enforcement officials. Um, you know, a lot of people may not be aware of this, but uh, when I called and reached out to the FBI regarding them joining the task force, they were reluctant at first. Hmm. Uh, now, he speaks a little fast, so I definitely have to stop this. Um, I don't know if any, any of you caught what he just said. But he said when he first became the police commissioner of Suffolk County, he reached out to the FBI and the FBI was reluctant 
because of what happened in the past, as we know, former police chief James Burke called off the FBI and DA's Tom Spoda, who both, both of those scumbags, Tom Spoda is still in jail. Chief James Burke, disgraced chief, called off the FBI. Fast forward to 2022, when he calls Chief uh, Police Commissioner Harrison calls the FBI, he says it right here in this interview that was uploaded five hours ago that the FBI was reluctant because of the way Suffolk County shunned them in the past. Shady is an understatement, Tory Thomas. When I called and reached out to the FBI regarding them joining the task force, they were reluctant at first. Hmm. Uh, they were concerned about, I guess, some past relationships where um, they weren't necessarily part of being inside the loop of, of the case. Uh, so I reassured them and said, that's something that you don't have to worry about any further. Um, I need you. I need your expertise. I need your specialty teams to really be part of um, this team of investigators that I'm looking to put together. Secondly, um, and there's a lot of different avenues I want to uh, talk about, but uh, I thought it was important that we were transparent. Uh, you know, you, you take a look at some of the podcasts and a lot of different things that you were saying about the Suffolk County Police Department and their role in Gilgo and they're covering it up. Uh, I thought it was important that we that we came became transparent. So one of the things that I took a close. So what he's saying here is because of the past behavior of past administrations, he wanted to come aboard and be transparent and gain the public's trust and regain that trust that we need. Police investigators and police departments need the relationship with the public because the public helps us solve cases. And he took the training from community policing, which is the backbone of the NYPD, community policing, he took that to Suffolk County and applied it. And he applied it successfully because we have Rex Hurman in custody because of the efforts of this police commissioner and the entire task force, the entire team of men and women who work their ass off to get Rex Hurman in custody. Uh, you know, you, you take a look at some of the podcasts and a lot of different things that you were saying about the Suffolk County Police Department and their role in Gilgo and they're covering it up. Uh, I thought it was important that we that we came became transparent. So one of the things that I took a closer look at is, well, you know, why are we not sharing the, the Shannon Gilbert audio and and letting it be known that we believe that is an actual uh, an, an unfortunate incident? Like, why are we not sharing that? And after I spoke to uh, my detective lieutenant and a couple other investigators, that was something that we um, thought was important to, to share. So let's let people know, hey, listen, um, your perception of what happened, your perception of the Suffolk County Police Department is inaccurate. And playing that audio, I think, changed it in the right direction. So in essence, my NYPD experience, uh, learning to be transparent, to get people to trust our organization, I, I believe was uh, very, very helpful going forward with the investigation. So um, let's talk a bit about our, the suspect. There's been a lot of reporting on how some reexamination of old evidence mm -hmm. uh, led to the arrest of the suspect, uh, Rex Hurman. But I would imagine, and you'll tell me, you had to go back and did you do re-interviews, new interviews? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was more than that, yes? You know, I, I, not only did we do re-interviews, uh, and there was a lot of different investigative steps that uh, I can't tell you every little thing because I'm sure you understand still going through a judicial process. Uh, but I even took the time out and sat down with. Did anybody catch what he said there? And he said it so subtly. He said, I really can't tell you about our interview, our, our interview tactics because it's an ongoing investigation and we're going through the judicial process. This is what. Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney should understand. But if I played these two interviews, the, the, the interview with the district attorney, which was five days ago, and this interview simultaneously side by side, it would just be night and day. 
she peppers him with all kinds of pressing questions about the investigation, about how they captured Rex Hurman. And he, just in a professional, you know, um, polite way, he just put her in a place and said, I can't go there. I, I loved what he did right there. Interviews, new interviews. I mean, it was more than that, yes? You know, I, I, not only did we do re-interviews, uh, and there was a lot of different investigative steps that uh, I can't tell you every little thing because I'm sure you understand still going through a judicial process. Uh, but I even took the time out and sat down with John Ray and to see what type of information he had. He was claiming that John Ray is the attorney who represents um, Shannon Gilbert. And he also represents um, a, a, another one of the un, um, unidentified victims. Uh, actually, one of the, I, I stand corrected, John Ray is representative for Shannon Gilbert and Jessica Taylor. Um, so he says that he reached out to John Ray. And a lot of people don't like John Ray's approach, but a lot of people appreciate his approach. So here's a Suffolk County police commissioner reaching out to John Ray. I was shocked when I heard that, but I was very happy. Interviews, uh, and there was a lot of different investigative steps that uh, I can't tell you every little thing because I'm sure you understand still going through a judicial process. Uh, but I even took the time out and sat down with John Ray and to see what type of information he had. He was claiming that the Suffolk County Police Department wasn't getting in contact with him regarding information that he had regarding uh, Shannon Gilbert. Mm -hmm. So I made sure that I made myself available for him and see what he had to do or, or, or say, excuse me. Um, I wanted to make sure that anybody that was in our custody uh, was being debriefed. That's why I reached out to Earl Toulon and asked him to put a liaison that's going to speak to anybody who might have been a, uh, involved in sex work between the time frame of 2007 and 2011, just to kind of uh, re-interview them and see if they knew anything about the, the, the Gilgo investigation. So he took a liaison and in, embedded them in the, in the Suffolk County jail, which is huge in Riverhead. I've been in that jail many, many a times. They have a jail in Riverhead, they have a jail in Yapank, and then they have also a jail in Central Islip. So there's like three or more jails in Suffolk County, but the main one in Riverhead um, they have a liaison embedded because of the police commissioner here, Rodney Harrison, and he ordered them to interview all of the girls who were in there for prostitution crimes doing time to see if they had any information as it pertains to Gilgo. That is tremendous behind the scenes work because that's what you need to do to get a case solved don't forget he came in he was sworn in in december of 2021 he took the the reins january 1st of 2022 so as soon as he hit the ground running in january of 2022 task force formed in february arrest of rex Hurman. 16 months later so there you go he was identified March 14th of 2022 and collared 16 months later. So there were a lot of different avenues that we uh, that we tackled uh, regarding trying to rejuvenate this case. You know, I even took a look at the Crime Stoppers tip award. It was at twenty five thousand dollars. I said, listen, we got to double it. We got to raise it to fifty thousand dollars. That may get somebody to to come forward. The um, Megan Waterman video over in Hot Park. I said, listen, let's show that. Maybe that will show people that we're trying to get you to somebody to come forward and give us information. Any little help can assist us going in the right direction. So uh, putting the task force together, uh, coming with different innovative ideas, things that I learned in, in the city uh, allowed us to be in a place where we are today, which was to identify Rex Hurman and uh, bring him into custody. Well, I'm going to double back on Shannon Gilbert for a while. Is there so I, I want to stop this right here. First of all, uh, thank you, Ron Daniels, for the $50 super sticker. Much appreciated. And thank you for being a channel member. 
Um, so the police commissioner is going to say something that may get us upset. Um, I listened, obviously, I had the um, liberty to listen. I took the liberty to listen to this interview in its entirety. And I also listened to Ray Tierney's interview. I don't think we'll have enough time to play Ray, Ray Tierney's, but um, he says that the investigation into Shannon Gilbert is not ongoing and that they're not investigating it, that it was a tragic accident. And this is, I'm just preempting you guys. I want you guys to be ready for this because this is one of the things that um, a lot of us may not agree with. Um, so th that's what he's going to go on to say here. And he also talks about the Atlantic City for women who uh, were also uh, escorts, sex workers. Uh, Rex Hurman is not, in, uh, in, in his words, involved or tied into those crimes at Atlantic City. And he says it here also that Rex Hurman is not involved in Shannon Gilbert's accident, as he calls it. So just getting you guys ready. Don't shoot the messenger. Anything in the investigation that changes the notion that she, her death was accidental or that she was not a part of this the mass murders out there? It's a horrible accident. It's a horrible accident. And uh, as, of, as of right now, uh, uh, myself and uh, the investigators assigned to the homicide squad uh, still believe that it was just an uh, incident where uh, she ran into the marsh and unfortunately drowned uh, on, that, on that horrible day. You've said that the green avalanche, the Chevy avalanche was key. How yeah. did you get there? <clears throat> so uh, one of the investigators that was assigned to the task force, uh, she came from the state police. And uh, I'll, I'll get into how the state police uh, became part of the task force in a second. But they had access to a certain type of database that they were able to track down a green avalanche inside that Massapequa Park box. And then we were able to take a look at that car being registered to um, our subject, Rex Hurman. And once we got that information, that intel, then we started looking to uh, Rex Hurman's lifestyle. Uh, we started working with the district attorney's office and uh, taking a look at, it, at at phone records and getting subpoenas for a host of other things. And it really assisted us in uh, honing in our efforts into uh, Mr. Hurman. I've investigated homicides personally. Um, I was a detective in the 7-1 squad. Homicide investigations don't always go in the right direction. Uh, the first subject that you identify sometimes is not always the individual who um, is held accountable. Um, a lot of people are challenging the Suffolk County Police Department regarding beginning steps in the investigation and, and what was done wrong. And I think it's very unfair. Uh, I, I will say this, that uh, this was a long journey of a case. Uh, there was some good work done prior to me getting here. I want to make sure that this is very clear regarding identifying the, the box in Massapequa Park and as well as uh, over in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, but just putting that dedicated team together, um, putting that one investigator from the state police and putting them to the task force. And now she, she using her database helped us uh, really get this case some, some good legs and uh, be able to identify Rex Hurman and go forward with being able to place him under arrest. Now, when you say the box, you're talking about the box that <clears throat> was made identifiable through cell phone Correct. data analysis. Correct. L let me ask you this. You said publicly you called Rex Hurman a demon. Ladies and gentlemen, Rex Hurman is a demon that walks among us. A predator that ruined families. At what point did you decide that that was the best characterization of him? Yeah, you know, and a lot of people have, uh, I won't say challenged me for using that word. Uh, I'm going to tell everybody right now that I'm speaking on behalf of the family. Um, anybody that uh, lost a loved one to this predator, I'm sure they feel the same way. Uh, and as I was uh, writing out my talking points, and as, as well as I was working with my uh, PIO, uh, we felt that was the right word. Um, this is somebody that ruined families. And uh, 
I'm just blessed to be in a position to see him being held accountable. Uh, I will also share there's a lot more work to be that needs to be done. We still have six other bodies that we need to um, uh, identify who the killer is. Um, but as of, as of now, uh, it was just really great work by the men and women of the task force. Uh, I got to thank my Detective Lieutenant Kevin Byer. I got to thank uh, some of the individuals uh, assigned from the district attorney's office. There was a, a retired lieutenant by the name of Rich Zacharis, and there's another retired lieutenant, Bill Buchanan. Uh, both of those individuals were there on a daily basis. I just want to say um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Suffolk County Police Commissioner Harrison for sticking with his statement, owning that statement that Rex Uriman is a demon, and also giving us further insight as to that he took the family's feelings, the victim's families, into account when he prepared that statement. And if you could remember, this police commissioner hugged every one of those family members who were at the press conference. So kudos to him for owning that statement and not backpedaling like many politicians would do because he said he took a lot of heat. I'm going to put it back because I want you guys to hear what he says. He says he took a lot of heat, but he didn't back down. Melanie Little, good to see you in the chat. Thank you. Your, your, your messages are definitely going through. I see them. So let's take a listen to this again. Uh, be able to identify Rex Hurum. What? Uh, we felt that was the right word. Everybody right now that I'm speaking on behalf of the family is a demon. Police and putting them to the task force. And now she, she using her database helped us uh, really get this case some, some good legs and uh, be able to identify Rex Hurum and, and go forward with being able to place him under arrest. And, and that state, female state investigator that he mentioned there, and I, I missed speaking about that, this female investigator from the state used the lawman search to search the vehicle information that they had from the very beginning that they never acted on. It took a good quality leader like this guy to come in and say, I'm the fresh set of eyes. We are the fresh set of eyes. We are going to solve this case. He said it from the beginning. He said it at a podium. This case is solvable. And they did it. So kudos to the state police, the female investigator. Uh, now, when you say the box, you're talking about the box that mm. was made identifiable through cell phone Correct. data analysis. Correct. L let me ask you this. You said publicly you called Rex Hureman a demon. Ladies and gentlemen, Rex Hureman is a demon that walks among us. A predator that ruined families. At which point did you decide that that was the best characterization of him? Yeah, you know, and a lot of people have, uh, I'm going to say, challenged me for using that word. Uh, I'm going to tell everybody right now that I'm speaking on behalf of the family. Um, anybody that uh, lost a loved one to this predator, I'm sure they feel the same way. Uh, and as I was uh, writing out my talking points, and as, as well as I was working with my uh, PIO, uh, we felt that was the right word. Um, this is somebody that ruined I love families. It. And uh, I'm just blessed to be in a position to see him being held accountable. Uh, I will also share there's a lot more work to be, that needs to be done. We still have six other bodies that we need to um, identify who the killer is. Um, but as of, as of now, uh, it was just really great work by the men and women of the task force. Uh, I got to thank my Detective Lieutenant Kevin Byer. I got to thank uh, some of the individuals uh, assigned from the district attorney's office. There was a, a. So here he is giving kudos to his lieutenant, Detective Byers, and then he immediately gives credit to the Suffolk County district attorney investigators. That's a gentleman, that's a guy who has left and checked his ego at the door, as we heard in the beginning of this, that you have to, if you're going to be a part of this task force, 
check your ego at the door. And this is what it looks like. A retired lieutenant by the name of Rick, uh, we felt that was the right word. Um, this is somebody that ruined families. We still have six other bodies that we need to um, uh, identify who the killer is. Um, but as of, as of now, uh, it was just really great work by the men and women of the task force. Uh, I got to thank my Detective Lieutenant Kevin Byer. I got to thank uh, some of the individuals uh, assigned from the district attorney's office. There was a, a retired lieutenant by the name of Rich Zacharis. And there's another retired lieutenant, Bill Buchanan. Uh, both of those individuals were there on a daily basis regarding having meetings and getting updates and providing information to our pit bull district attorney, Ray Tierney. So it was, it was a nice team effort. I've never heard Tierney speak about this police commissioner on a regular basis when he's interviewed. As a matter of fact, I, I know of many interviews where he doesn't even mention police commissioner Harrison. He just, police commissioner Harrison just referred to him to the district attorney as a pit bull. That's checking your ego at the door. That's what it looks like. Of everybody coming together, I said this before, eagles were left at the door and make a retired lieutenant by the name of Rich Zacharis. And there's another retired lieutenant, Bill Buchanan. Uh, both of those individuals were there on a daily basis regarding having meetings and getting updates and providing information to our pit bull district attorney, Ray Turney. So it was, it was a nice team effort of everybody coming together. I said this before, eagles were left at the door and making sure we worked in harmony on the same sheet of music to uh, identify Rex Heerman. On now, the same you, sheet you, of music. You, there's been some discussion about it. What, what went into the decision to go ahead and arrest him, yeah. right? Um, so guns, uh, we, you didn't know all, but you knew he had some. Mm. And sex workers, that he was still uh, approaching or dealing with sex workers. Mm. His continuing contact with sex workers, were those women in trouble? Was there a plan to protect these women? So he asked, she asked him, you were, you took him down because you knew that he had 92 gun permits. He was, he had 92 permits for these different weapons, these handguns, uh, not including the long rifles, which accumulated or added up to 279 or 270 something. But she says to him, he was communicating with sex workers and you guys were monitoring him. Is, was this one of the reasons you took him down because you felt he was going to kill again? So she asked some great questions. And does anybody think that she sounds like Barbara Walters? If you close your eyes and you're not watching this, could she have Barbara Walter-esque sounding voice? Thank you, K.H. Walker, 279 guns. Thank you. Yeah, it, you know, it, it, was a, it was a lot of different layers, by the mm -hmm. way. I want to... uh, we, you didn't know all, but you knew he had some. Mm -hmm. And sex workers, that he was still uh, approaching or dealing with sex workers. Mm -hmm. His continuing contact with sex workers, were those women in trouble? Was there a plan to protect these women? Yeah, it, you know, it, it, was, it was a lot of different layers, by the mm -hmm. way. I want to make sure that that's very clear um, between Internet searches, between his lifestyle and other activities. But, uh, you know, him also having at the time, we believe, uh, 97 firearms. Uh, you know, there was a concern regarding is he going to attack again? And as well as is the information going to leak out? You know, uh, is this case knowing that we were on to him, is it going to get back to Rex Sherman? You know, we, we weren't sure, you know, how long we could keep it, keep it tight. So with all these different layers there, you know, uh, working with Ray Turney, working with Steve Udis, working with uh, Mike Brodick from the FBI, uh, we all came to a determination that today's the day to, to bring this man down. So he, you're, he, you've arrested him. He's, you've got him in custody. You go and you search family home, two storage facilities, and now you've got the avalanche. Yeah. What were you looking for? I, would, I really want to ask, did you find anything? But I know you're going to tell me that. Right. So the question as, is, what, were you, know the what, what are you looking for? Right. So anything uh, that could connect Rex Sherman to what we call the Gilgo Four or the other people that were recovered, that we discovered over an Ocean uh, Parkway or 
somewhere somewhere something something else listen um the first uh body went missing in 2007. Uh, rex Sherman was i believe 43 years old at that time is this his first time dealing with sex workers is this the first time that he's uh might have hurt or or, or killed somebody uh, time will tell that's why the task force is going to stay in place that's why i've actually added a couple more investigators to the task force to uh, help out with uh, concerns or something that may be connected to other parts of the country. Has Rex Hureman killed others? He said, time will tell. That is why I added more investigators to the task force. So we've come to find out. Again, this is his first interview in three weeks, three whole weeks since Rex Hureman was taken into custody we have not heard from the Suffolk County Police Commissioner. And there has got to be a reason behind why we didn't hear from them. But he said, time will tell. And we are continually investigating and looking into the possibilities that he could be responsible or behind more of these murders. So it's important that people understand that we're, we're in a okay place, but there's still a lot more work that needs to be done. We were able to bring comfort to three families. Uh, we're very close to a fourth one, but we still have more work to do to identify the subject or subjects that were involved with the other bodies that were discovered. Okay. So you, you mentioned suspects. Is there, is it, is there somebody else running around out there that uh, we on Long Island need to be concerned with? So she's talking quick too. And, and I had a hard time hearing I had to listen to this twice. She said, is there somebody else running around Long Island that's a killer? Do we need to be concerned? And this is a good, valid question. Shit, my wife asked me this question recently. I know Melanie Little. She, she thinks about this. She definitely thinks about this. Are there more serial killers running around Long Island? And this reporter asks him outright. Covered. Okay, so you, you mentioned suspects. Is there, is, it, is there somebody else running around out there that uh, we on Long Island need to be concerned with? I wish I could give you an answer. Um, I can't tell you at this time. Uh, is Rex Hureman uh, going to be held accountable for the other bodies over there in Ocean Parkway? Uh, time will tell. Um, but if not, we'll continue to work hard and see if there's uh, other individuals involved and, and track them down as well and make sure we bring them into custody. Well, in all of your search, I have to ask, is there, was there any indication of victims or violence in the house, in the storage unit, in the truck? I'm sure you could understand. I, I can't talk too much about what was recovered and the, the details of uh, those items that were uh, brought into our, our, our custody. Um, but I, I will say this, um, we have Ray Tierney in, uh, in the position to make sure he needs what he needs to go forward with the prosecution. And working with our medical examiner's office, uh, our state police, recovering uh, items from his residence, from the storage facility, getting that avalanche from South Carolina, bringing it up, and uh, wherever else uh, things come to our attention, We'll continue to investigate it and make sure we uh, provide our district attorney with all the evidence going so he can go forward with it. Are you looking at... Okay, another trigger warning here. I have my notes. And at this point in the conversation, she asks him, are you looking at him for crimes outside of the New York and Long Island area? The answers that you hear here may trigger you and it may cause you to not agree with this. But remember, they have access to much, much more investigatory information than we, the public, have. So he's answering these questions because he knows everything about this case and everything that they have and everything that they don't have. So remember, when, when you hear him answer this, it may not be what you want to hear, but guess what? The investigators know a hell of a lot more 
than what we know as citizens. And I'm here with you guys because when I heard him say this, my heart kind of sunk. But I'd rather him be honest than to feed us a line of bullshit. Bringing it up and uh, wherever else uh, things come to our attention, we'll continue to investigate it and make sure we uh, provide our district attorney with all the evidence going so he can go forward with it. Are you looking at missing women or unsolved deaths at this particular point in time? So that's why we added more uh, investigators to the, uh, to the task force. And if there's something that possibly may have a connection or a modus operandi uh, similar to uh, what we saw in Ocean Parkway, these investigators are going to make sure they work with that local law enforcement authority and see if it's connected to Rex Sherman or maybe to somebody else. So when you talked about modus operandi, uh, strangulation is what you're looking at, the way the bodies were disposed. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, you know, once again, is that something I, I can't share regarding the uh, the way that uh, the deaths were um, uh, done by, by Mr. Herman? I, I, I will say this, that uh, uh, we know it's a homicide uh, based upon certain parts of the body and how it was examined by a medical examiner's office, but regarding uh, how it was done, I can't share that with you at this time. Okay, I have to stop it right here, and I hate to get all hopped up here, but I have to do this. I, now I need, again, it, those of you who are watching here live and those of you who are gonna listen to this on a replay, this same exact question was posed to District Attorney Ray Tierney. And the answer that he gave, Ray Tierney, the district attorney gave her, and the answer that this investigative professional, this police commissioner, are two complete polar opposites. He said to her that the medical examiner's office handles that, which is that's what they do. We've had Barbara Butcher on hundreds of times with us, right? This guy's a pro. When she asked that same question to Ray Tierney, he talked about skeletal remains. He talked about not having flesh. He talked about um, if someone is stabbed, how we, there'd be, he went into a whole diatribe of things. Man, I wish I had it queued up. I would, I would play it right now for you. But you got to listen to it for yourself. It's, it's just night and day. It's night and day. How important is DNA evidence uh, in, in this? I, I noticed his attorney is saying, no, we don't want to do this this cheek swab. But from your perspective, how important? Did, did anybody hear Ray Tierney's interview? I, I'm going to play a little bit of it. I, now I have to. I'm going to extend this live stream a little bit past an hour. So hang around for it. But man, this woman asked the sim same question to him. And he gave her this long ass. He had diarrhea of the mouth. That's the best way I could put it. He had diarrhea in the mouth, and he said so many different things that didn't even need to be said. Is DNA evidence here? Humongous. Let's talk about the cheek swap now. Um, uh, done by, by Mr. Herman. I, I, I... How important is DNA evidence uh, in, in this? How important is DNA evidence? And he says it's humongous. I've never heard a police professional say DNA is humongous, but I like it. I like it. It's a New York thing. He said it's humongous. Yes, I, I noticed his attorney is saying, no, we don't want to do this, this cheek swab. But from your perspective, how important is DNA evidence here? Humongous. It, it puts him on the scene. Humongous. Um, you know, one thing scene. is having a green avalanche, but having uh, his DNA attached to the bodies is, is, is a game changer. It tells a lot. Uh, he, it tells that that he was somehow involved in these uh, victims' lives. And uh, that's something that's going to be very, very valuable going forward with the prosecution. Um, updates from other jurisdictions. We know a lot of people were working, or you guys are working with a lot of others. Uh, here it comes. Here, here comes what I thought was coming before, but this is it. She's asking him now about other jurisdictions. I was hoping to hear... Yes, we're working with South Carolina authorities. Yes, we're working with the Atlantic City authorities. Yes, we're working with uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Yes, we're looking at all the different locations he traveled to. 
yes, we're looking at international uh, places anywhere and everywhere he traveled. But take a listen to this. The people trying to figure that out. Is there any updates that you can give us? Not at this time. I know there was uh, some concerns about uh, some of the unfortunate bodies that were discovered in Atlantic City. Um, at this time, we don't believe that there's any connection uh, to, the, to those uh, unfortunate uh, uh, victims. Uh, so as of right now, we don't have any connection to anything else, uh, not just in the state of New York, but around the country. But I will say this, we'll continue to investigate and uh, we're working with uh, any local authority that uh, has a concern about Rex Sherman possibly being a suspect um, in something that they might have discovered as well. Mr. Huberman has said that he is not guilty, and his attorney in defending him has said this, and I'll read this to you. While the government has decided to focus on him, mm -hmm. despite more significant and stronger evidence, we're looking forward to defending him in a court of law before a fair and impartial jury of his peers. Is there anything you can tell us about what the lawyers characterize as, uh, and I quote him, more significant and stronger evidence? Is he, what's he talking about? Any idea? I have no idea. All I know is this. He's in our custody, he's off the streets, and we're gonna to look to make sure that he doesn't come out ever again. Have you had occasion to All I know, he's in our custody, and we're gonna to look to make sure he never comes out on the street again. There's just so many great points in this interview. Uh, I love his responses to her, clear, concise, and to the point. Significant and stronger evidence. What's he talking about, any idea? I have no idea. All I know is this. He's in our custody, he's off the streets, and we're gonna to look to make sure that he doesn't come out ever again. Have you had occasion to speak to him or see him? Not my job. I freaking love this guy. I love him. Gotta to, got to hear it one more time. Can tell us about what the lawyers characterize as, uh, and I quote him, more significant and stronger evidence. He, what's he talking about, any idea? I have no idea. All I know is this, he's in our custody, he's off the streets, and we're gonna to look to make sure that he doesn't come out ever again. Have you had occasion to speak to him or see him? Not my job. Have you had an occasion to see him or speak to him? Not my job. And that is 1,000% correct. Not my job. Thank you. Have you talked to people in your department who have had a chance to talk to him and see him? I did. Uh, one of my detectives that... Uh, uh, first engaged him and told him he was under arrest. Uh, he uh, told me a little uh, snapshot about how that engagement went. Uh, but outside of that, um, I'm more worried about uh, continuing to keep the task force together and making sure that going forward, we still continue to investigate the other bodies uh, over on Ocean Parkway. Well, I've seen video, I think many of us have, of your guys, I believe, walking behind him. Yeah. It was at 35th and 5th in the city. Yeah. Uh, what can you tell us about, was he surprised? Did he see it coming? Was he expecting this? G especially given in the bail sheet that you knew that he was trying to figure out what you guys were doing. What I was told is that um, he didn't see it coming uh, regarding his level of surprise or uh, uh, any other thing that he might have uh, done regarding his actions. Uh, I'm not privy to it. Uh, the one thing is that the tactically uh, did it correct. Uh, we had a, a plan in place to make sure that uh, none of my officers or investigators got hurt. Uh, I'm very uh, proud of how they handled the situation. And then we were able to uh, bring it back with no incident. So it was really uh, good work um, uh, by the homicide investigators, as well as the um, the work with District Attorney Ray Tierney and, and really saying that, hey, listen, we got to move forward with this case. This is about five times in this interview that he gave credit to Ray Tierney, the District Attorney. In the interview that I'm going to scan through after this, you're not going to hear a mention of Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison from Ray Tierney. I sense there is some type of tension there. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, but I could be wrong. But I'm pretty good at feeling out and, and reading the vibe. And the vibe 
is completely polar opposite when it comes from Ray Tierney to uh, Police Chief Harrison. But Police Chief Harrison to Tierney is a completely different vibe. Um, I've been around the police department long enough, and listen, he was the chief of detectives. I was a detective, so he was in charge of the detectives, and he knows how to investigate cases. So this is this is this is a great leader, and Suffolk County, the residents of Suffolk County, are lucky that this guy is at the helm. I'm proud of Chief Harrison. Police Commissioner Harrison. I, I mean, I, I keep referring to him as chief because that's what he was on on the NYPD. He was the chief of detectives, chief of the department. Well, now she asks him about political stuff. She goes into the political arena because when you have police, when you talk about police and investigations, it always is political. Politi politics always comes into it because you usually have a mayor, which is the Suffolk County police, the Suffolk County executive, which is uh, Ballone. He put him into, uh, into the police commissioner spot. The police commissioner is not a uh, civil service rank. It's, in a, it's an appointment. You get it. You get appointed. It's a civilian. He's a civilian. In the NYPD and in all the police departments, the police chief in the big departments, there's a chief. The police commissioner is the main guy. The police chiefs wear uniforms. The, the commissioner, like him, you'll never see him in a uniform. He's a civilian employee. Um, but it's, it's a political uh, appointment. And she asks him. She goes there. And he, the way he handles this is unbelievable. Well, this is Long Island, so we have to talk about politics, right? We absolutely <laughs> have to. Um, I love this lady. Your boss, and you've mentioned him before, Steve Ballone, he's mm -hmm. term limited, so he's out of here mm -hmm. at the at the end of the year. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your plans? He sticks up for him here. Yeah, Listen well, first of all, um, I, you know, we say he's out of here like that's a uh, kind of like a good riddance. Uh, no, no, I, 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 I don't mean that at all. Oh, okay. Term limits kind of take you to that Got point, it. though. I just, I just want to make sure that... Uh, I had the utmost respect for that man. Yes. Uh, he gave me opportunity. To uh, he speaks fast, so I'm going to just tell this for you, to you guys. And I know I'm going to get shit for this. But, well, Duty Ron, you promised you weren't going to stop this, but I had to stop this. He speaks fast. He said, I want to get something clear here. I have the utmost respect for Steve Ballone, who's the county executive. That's like the mayor of New York City. We have a, Na a county executive in Nassau. Uh, and we have a county executive in Suffolk. Not at all. Oh, okay. Term limits kind of take you to that Got point, I just, though. I just want to make sure that uh, I had the utmost respect for that man. Yes. Uh, he gave me opportunity to be the police commissioner out here. And just the, the things that I've seen the last 18, 19 months that I've been here have been uh, very, very impressive. I'll make sure that that's clear. Regarding my next steps, um, time will tell. Um, you know, whatever comes my way, I'll always make sure I share it with my family. Uh, I'm not sure if you wear this, but my wife's a retired lieutenant, so she knows this uh, journey very well. Two of my daughters are New York City police officers. Uh, Two of his daughters are New York City police officers. His wife is a retired lieutenant. His whole entire family is in law enforcement. And he said, what I do next, I will speak about it with my family first and make a decision. You gotta love him. He's a family guy, which I'm very proud of. And I still have one daughter that's uh, playing college basketball, which uh, I try to get down as much as possible to catch her game. So um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Uh, we'll see uh, who wins the uh, the position of the next county executive. I'm not sure if they're going to reach out to me regarding potentially retaining me or not. But if not, then so he said, I don't know if the new Suffolk County executive, whoever gets elected, because term limits. The current has to leave. Um, but if he retains me as a civilian police com uh, chief, uh, commissioner, I'll, I'll have to make that. He, he can't run again, D. Banks. He, he reached his term limits. So he, he, like she said in the beginning, he cannot run again. He served the maximum under the, the law of Suffolk County for the county executive. So he can't come back. So it, most of the times when there's a new 
county executive, like that's the equivalent of a mayor, they appoint their own police commissioner or they retain the one that's there currently. So we'll see how that goes. Scott says it's going to be an ugly election. But if, 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 the, if a new executive comes in, new county executive comes in, they would be a fool to get rid of this guy. And whoever gets that position lets Rodney Harrison go. In, in, my, um, in my opinion, here, this is what I would feel about that. Pardon my French, but you're an asshole. I'll, uh, I'll find something to do. Well, you got ahead of me there because I was going to ask if they did reach out and ask you to stay, would you? Uh, it'd be something that I have to sh discuss with my family and then we'll uh, make a decision. Um, we'll make a decision together. Well, let's try a different way. So whether you stay or whether you go, mm -hmm. what should happen to the task force mm -hmm. next, even if it goes into another administration and another uh, police commissioner? Well, I will say that uh, if anybody that comes in behind me and they choose to uh, dismantle the task force, shame on them. Uh, the task force is what got us. This is what makes him a stand-up guy. And she said, he said to her in, her in response to her question, whoever comes in after me, if they let me go and they dismantle this task force, shame on them. In the place where we are today. Well, let's try a different way. So whether you stay or whether you go, mm -hmm. what should happen to the task force mm -hmm. next, even if it goes into another administration and another uh, police commissioner? Well, I will say that uh, if anybody that comes in behind me and they choose to uh, dismantle the task force, shame on them. Uh, the task force is what got us in the place where we are today. Um, a lot of great work, a lot of long days, a lot of hours uh, put into this investigation. And, but I will say this, we still have more uh, uh, victims to uh, investigate. And um, if you take the task force away, um, who's to say that we won't go backwards? So I hopefully, if I'm not here, uh, whoever comes in after me, my replacement, we'll keep the task force together. So that was a fantastic interview. Um, <clears throat> by a show of hands here, who wants to hear Ray Tierney? He's interviewed by the same woman. She asks him similar questions. Do we want to hear this or should I link it in the description and let everybody listen to it in the description? I'll let the chat decide. Put a one in the chat if you want to hear it. Put a two in the chat if you're tired, you want to go to bed like I do. Just let me know. If you want to hear it, I'll play some of it, but I'm not going to play all of it. That's for sure. It was five days ago. Let's see. I see a lot of ones in the chat. A lot of ones. Everybody wants to hear it. All right. His interview shot appearances, including this one. Okay, so they're both about twenty-six minutes. So I thought his was longer, but um. All right. We'll listen to it. So bad mom, <laughs> bad mom says no. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. We'll, we'll scan through it. We're not going to listen to it all. Um, we'll, we'll listen to 10 minutes of it. 10 minutes, and then we're out. I promise. Um, 10 minutes, and we're out. Yeah, 1.5. I'll, I'll, I'll speed it up. Let me get the settings on. Speed 1.5. Thank you for that. Whoever... whoever <laughs> Whoever suggested 1.5, you get a prize. Um, just five more minutes. There you go. Tax cut says 1.5 speed. All right, here we go. Studio 2 and no, Suffolk that's... District Attorney is planning to prosecute the case himself. When I took office in January 2022, I made uh, Gilgo a priority. DA Ray Tierney is sitting down with Newsday TV for a one-on-one -on -one interview and talking about why it took so long to make an arrest, where the case goes from here, and why. He's taking the lead in the courtroom. Welcome to New State Studio 2 in Melville and our conversation with uh, Suffolk District Attorney Ray Tierney. So let's talk a bit about uh, Gilgo, oh, okay. if that's okay with sure. you, right? Gilgo has attracted a lot of attention nationally and internationally. 
from all over the place, right? But you and I both live here along with two million other, two million or so other Long Islanders. What's the current state of the investigation? So we've, uh, you know, we've indicted uh, the defendant on uh, uh, three of what has traditionally been called uh, the Gilgo Four murders. Uh, we're still working on the fourth murder, which is the murder of, of Maureen Brainerd Barnes. Uh, those are allegations. Uh, he's charged with murder of, of the three other victims. Um, there are allegations. We look forward to proving them in court. And, uh, you know, we when we came into office in January of 2022, we started the task force. Uh, March 14th of 2022, we... So he takes credit for the task force. This is the first red flag here in this interview. We uh, identified Rex Yerman as a suspect. And basically, you know, we were off and running, uh, proceeding with our investigation. Uh, and uh, we we charged three out of the four. And uh, now that we're, we're at that point, uh, we, uh, we went overt. We... Uh, executed a number of search warrants. Uh, so we're preparing uh, that, that case for trial. We're continuing to investigate those those murders as well as the murder of Maureen Brainer Barnes. And we've expanded the investigation to uh, the other bodies on Gilgo. So we, there's a, we, a lot we. of work to be done. Um, you said that you had thought that there would be something on Maureen Brainerd Barnes soon. Define soon. Well, I mean, uh, so I think at at the time of the press conference, I said that there was that balance when you do an investigation like this between uh, the, the secrecy of the grand jury uh, investigation and the produ productivity of that investigation, but then that's counterbalanced against uh, the, the, the fear that the, the, the investigation is gonna get disclosed or um, considerations of public safety. So um, you know, just prior to the defendant's arrest, we felt that the balance had shifted. So we 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 had done that. Um, so so once that's concluded, you know, now now we go out and uh, we continue the investigation. But there are still some some investigative steps that we need to take with regard to that fourth murder. To Miss Bray, three minutes and twenty one seconds into this, and there's not a mention of the Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison. To Ms. Brandon Parnes. Correct. Well, you have one suspect in custody. Uh, is there, uh, based on your investigation thus far, far, can you tell us, is there another suspected Gilgo killer out there uh, among us here on Long Island? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the other the other investigations uh, onto, onto Gilgo. I will talk about the Gilgo 4, and, and I will say that, again, these are just allegations, but he is the, uh, the lone suspect and, and the lone defendant. So he says that Rex Herman is the lone suspect, the lone defendant, as it pertains to the Gilgo Four. He didn't answer her question because she said, are there more suspects out there as it pertains to the remains of the seven other victims? Lone suspect, lone defendant. So you don't think that Long Islanders, we shouldn't be a little concerned? We should be very happy that this is what's happening now. I mean, I, I, you know, Long Island should always be concerned about public safety, but I don't think they have to worry about, uh, you know, that particular incident. All right. You spent weeks scouring this. Interesting contrast. Those of you who have been listening, interesting. Suspect's house, the storage unit, now you have his truck, that avalanche. How long is it going to take to go through that? When are you going to see something productive out of there? It's going to take uh, quite a while. Uh, because as we as we were talking, we were looking for trace evidence, uh, biological evidence, hair, blood, fibers, DNA. Uh, so all of that evidence has to be uh, taken, cataloged, and then swabbed, and then tested forensically. And it's not like on TV where you know uh, 15 minutes later you get a, get a result. It's going to take uh, weeks, if not months. Well, I'm going to ask as if I watch a lot of TV, which we all do. <laughs> is there any indication, or can you tell us if there's any indication from any of this that these women were killed in any of these other places? Well, I mean, I think the really the the only evidence you have is those those five question hairs that we talked about, um, three three of which have been uh, forensically tested and uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA uh, profiles have been uh, obtained. Uh, those mitochondrial DNA profiles, two two out of two of the hairs, consistent with the wife, one with the defendant. So, um, you know, from there, there's been speculation. It's just that speculation that that uh, the uh, murders might have occurred in the house allegedly. Uh, but of course, there's there's uh, lots of ways that uh, people's hair get on another person, uh, such as transference. So if I live with a person 
and that hair, their hair gets on me. And then I come in contact with a third party, both uh, my fibers, uh, my hair could get, uh, and my. He's been the district attorney since 2022, January of 2022 my spouses could, could get on that third person. So. Well, is there any indication that he may have been working with somebody else or that there is somebody else out there? No indication of that whatsoever. Uh, so he says no indication of that whatsoever, whereas the police commissioner said, I can't answer that question. Because really legitimately, as far as we know, they don't know who committed the other seven murders. So how could he say no to that? Um, has any of the evidence that you collected thus far uh, put you closer to charging anyone else, looking at anyone else? Uh, you know, we, we, we've broadened the um, investigation. We were, I think we were fortunate and pretty much as soon as we got on uh, the case, we were, we were uh, productive and we were working towards the Gilgo Four. Obviously, we wanted to... Uh, terminate that investigation and start the court case as soon as possible. So that's what we did. But, uh, you know, the, the downside to that is, you know, you, you can't do a, a full investigation. Uh, so we, we're doing it sort of in pieces. Uh, so that investigation uh, as to the other bodies are continuing. Uh, but just like with our initial investigation of the Gilgo Four, we're not going to talk about it until uh, we're ready to uh, charge in court. All right. Well, you, Newsday's reported uh, that you are now looking for DNA swabs of this particular suspect. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Do you think that this is going to help you connect him with, say, Brainerd Barnes? Well, that's a standard. Uh, that's a standard practice in, in cases. Um, so uh, I, it's been reported that we got uh, what is known as abandonment samples. Uh, so, uh, so this is from five days ago. Uh, again, fast forward to today. The the judge ordered that the um, that the defendant has to give. Uh, the bu the bu buccal swab, the cheek swab, buccal swab, buccal swab, however however you want to call it, it's a freaking cheek swab. You go in there with a you know a swab, a little Q tip or a long Q tip actually, and you swab it uh, inside of the mouth, inside the cheek. Typically, after you make an arrest on a case, um, and uh, you have the, the you have the defendant in custody, you take swabs just to confirm that the abandonment sample DNA uh, profiles are accurate. So, just to clarify, an abandonment sample is something that I take, chew on, or whatever, throw out, and you guys collect it. Yeah, you su surveil a subject, obtain either a bottle or uh, an article of food, perhaps, uh, and then test that. But obviously, that's not uh, as as definitive as an actual buccal swab from inside. Of right. The so, you know, pizza crust, that kind of thing. Um, so we are now hearing for the first time uh, in court papers, first time in court papers, that is, that a cause of death or presumptive cause of death. Oh, here it is. Strangulation. Here we go. All right. So this is the extreme contrast. I, I, this is, uh, we're going to finish with this because I can't listen to this crap anymore. But listen to what he says about this. I'll, I'll just let this play. Now, pretty early on in the investigation, uh, you guys were saying be, the remains were so degraded that there couldn't, determine a cause of death. Are you all, is this a cause of death? Is this a cause of death for one, for four? So the uh, the uh, Emmy's office examined uh, the uh, the remains of all four women. The, you know, given where they were left, they were left open to the elements, the, the amount of time they were out there, they were skeletonized. So uh, the, uh, the examination determined that their, the cause of death was homicidal violence, which simply means um, death caused at the hands of another. So strangulation. Well, uh, because it's uh, because there's uh, skeletonized, um, they can't determine exactly whether uh, exactly the cause of death, other than it was caused at the hands of, of the other. For instance, if uh, a person is stabbed, you would have um, damage to the flesh, um, and you might have damage to the skeleton uh, uh, skeletal area if if the if the the knife pierced the, the bones but if it doesn't pierce the bones the knife would never pierce the bone it would break it anyways this is what i was talking about the difference between a professional career executive investigator in uh police commissioner rodney harrison and the answer to the same exact question by a district attorney who does not investigate cases. He's not out in the field. 
He was a, a Brooklyn assistant district attorney in New York City and worked alongside of investigators and detectives, but he has never gone out and investigated a murder scene. Nevertheless, multiple murders. So this is the difference between someone who knows the business, that has walked the walk and talked the talk, meaning Chief Harrison, and now you guys are seeing the difference. This guy is got diarrhea of the mouth. He didn't need to explain any of this. Uh, talking about flesh and skeleton, skeletonized remains. This is the guy who's prosecuting the case. He's going to be in the courtroom. Don't you think that the, that the uh, defense attorney is going to re reference this interview? Are you fucking kidding me? Oh, man. I'm, I'm getting all flushed right now. <sighs> Good night. Good night, Literary Sanctuary. Thank you, the Literary Sanctuary. Thank you for hanging in there for an hour and 20. I'm wrapping it up, so oh, let me breathe. Woosa. Woosa. At the hands of, of the other. For instance, if uh, a person is stabbed, you would have um, damage to the flesh. Um, and you might have damage to the skeleton, uh, skeletal area if if the if the the knife pierced the, the bones but if it doesn't pierce the bones then you then you wouldn't have that damage and because there was nothing but skeleton um skeletal remains that was the cause of that bueller bueller uh, that that was the only cause bueller. Of that, that could be determined well so I, i'm referring to a footnote that we, mm -hmm. we wrote about in newsday today that mentions strangulation uh, or asphyxiation, I guess that's the formal term. This interview was from five days ago, by the way. Um, the, the judge should immediately you, utilize the gag order, immediately. And also we had talked to some of the families who said that their death certificates, that they received death certificates of their loved ones that talked about uh, asphyxiation. So you guys are not going, are, I mean, it's in a footnote. So, is so this homicidal violence is, uh, so asphyxia is a, is a, is a subgrouping of, of homicidal violence. I never heard that before. The asphyxiation, asphyxia, asphyxia is a subgroup of homicidal violence. And, and, and I, you know what? I've never heard in a cause and manner of death, homicidal violence. This is the first time I'm ever hearing that. Um, so, yeah. But the official cause of death is homicidal violence. Okay. Uh, well... If, if uh, strangulation is a subset of homicidal violence, let's talk about all these guns. Any indication from your evidence that any of this, this cache of guns that you found in the open or hidden in the suspect's house has anything to Listen do to with this. these victims? No evidence, and that would be highly unlikely because uh, a gun... Uh, getting shot with a bullet is a very violent thing, which which almost invariably causes damage to uh, your your skeletal system. And since there was no overt damage to the skeletal system, it seems highly unlikely. So he's told us that there's no damage to the skeletal system. We didn't need to know that. That should be coming out in court. And my thing is, I would say this. What are you people? On dope? So... I'm going to end this because my blood's boiling. I'm going to link the rest of this. This is 10 minutes in. We got another 18 minutes to this interview. He goes on and on and on for another 18 minutes. Look, it just keeps on going. It's like the Energizer Bunny. And it's just, it's, it's difficult to listen to at best. So I want to say thank you to everyone hanging in there for an hour and 30 on a Wednesday evening on a hump day going into Thursday. Again, I'm going to be following this case closely. Um, as new things come up, Ed Wallace and I, he's settled in the country that he's in. He's got good internet. We're going to be live. I think we'll do a Friday night forensics uh, this week. Um, I'm going to get uh, Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, who is a DNA and um, genetic genealogy expert. She's like CeCe Moore on steroids. She, Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick is going to join us uh, very soon, and we're going to talk about DNA 
as it pertains to this case and also as it pertains to Brian Kohlberger and the Idaho Four. So I hope everyone enjoyed this interactive live stream. I think we had some fun with this, but very concerning for the case. I think this district attorney needs a sock put in his mouth. I don't think we need to hear anything more from him. I think he needs to really just tone it down and um, let the police commissioner talk. Let Rodney Harrison talk, and I think we'd all be better off. If you're not yet subscribed, hit the subscribe button. Follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok, all one word, Duty Ron. And I want to say thank you to the replay viewers, the moderators, the folks who left Super Chats. Um, you guys are great. And, and for those of you who watch the replay and give super thanks, thank you. Uh, I love and respect each and every one of you. Good night from New York City. And God bless from Crime Time with Duty Ron. Stand by for a message from the cop team. And make sure you check out our new merch store. There's so many new items. There's coffee mugs, shirts, jackets, blood stains spatter not splatter all kinds of good stuff that was created so go and check out our merch store it's down in the shelf below i'll talk to you guys soon peace and love